Okay, so they're supposed to start in about four minutes. I am currently in the waiting room. Um, it says the meeting host will let you in soon. So I'm gonna show you like the email that they sent out before we, um, we did this. I have done some live streams about what's happening with the Progressive Caucus right now. They seem to be pretending that it's not happening because they just got put into provisional status and they're not really talking about it. They've made no statements about it. And instead, they are deflecting um, and uh, just talking about a bunch of stuff that's going on with Rusty, which I don't know. I, I, I really don't know to what degree they may have some sort of claim that Rusty's not cooperating with them. But uh, the fact that they have been issued some penalties by the party and they haven't addressed it, they've made no statement about it, and they do not appear to actually be doing any work towards meeting the remedies is very interesting. So let's see what happens here. Um, oftentimes with this particular faction of our party, they try and figure out ways to silence me or prevent me from attending. Um, I am... <laughs> Even as the um, editor and um, of and co-founder of Undercovered Magazine, I am a paid dues member of the California Democratic State Party Progressive Caucus. I am in good standing. Um, so it's all up to how they uh, are. Are you going to let me participate? <laughs> Is that going to happen tonight? Let's see what happens. All right. So here, here's where I'm right now. Uh, we are in the waiting room. It is supposed to start in two minutes. So while we're waiting to be admitted, I'll go ahead and show you the email that they sent earlier today. So this is the email they sent. Um, it is tonight, and we're going to have the Progressive Caucus. We have a fight on our hands. All hands on deck, troublemakers, because that's the name of the slate that they ran, y'all. Um Okay, so Rusty just sent out an email affirming that he will not follow the bylaws of the party to allow CDP delegates to have a general session discussion regarding fossil fuel money and law enforcement money in the party. Instead, he will make way for yet another committee that he is free to again ignore while quietly makes another deal with fossil fuel companies to again funnel money through the party to legislators that still block climate bills and still keep our siblings incarcerated for no good reason. Show up tonight. Let's discuss our response. Time to make some good trouble. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So here's how you register. If you guys want to attend the actual meeting, this is how you register. This is the agenda. Um, you can see that on the agenda, so they want to appoint three at-large officers. This was also highly contentious. Uh, this was something that Amar Amar uh, got voted in uh, the month before the new board election where uh, they increased their power by giving them appointments. They were able to appoint three additional people to their board, therefore um, stacking the board with people that are their friends. Um, from what I understand, uh, one of these people is like an Our Revolution person, another person is a Sunrise Movement person, and I don't know who the other one is, but um, but they're all going to be like within the network of this troublemaker slate that were all a part of this illicit pack that they still have not addressed. The fact that they were dealing with an illicit pack. So here we are at seven o'clock. Um, okay, okay. Let's see if they've started the meeting yet. It's seven now. They haven't started the meeting yet. It's seven right now, but what I my intention is that I'm going to give you some commentary while this is going on. Well, while we're waiting, let's get in here. So, uh, so, so that's the agenda: getting fossil fuel money and law enforcement money out of the party. The party is failing on the issue of law enforcement money and fossil fuel money. The influence of this money is mis unmistakable as so many legislative 
priorities die as a result of the opposition of those that that should be those who take the money but okay all right here we go I don't mean to be like your editor in the moment but that is the correct grammar it should have been who okay it's gonna be recorded it's probably being broadcast to y'all uh, Recording in progress. Saturday night with the Progressive Caucus, and look at all these friendly faces. I love it. Welcome, everybody. It's great to have you here. Um, we're going to get going a little bit. I'm going to play a video um, of someone that uh, folks might recognize, and then uh, I'm going to turn on the live stream, and then we'll get going with the rest of the meeting in just a couple minutes. But if you can hear me okay, thumbs up. Yes, I love it. All right, here we go. Let's see if I can share this screen. Okay. Growing up in Carson, a city in Los Angeles County, as a black kid with childhood asthma, my parents were always worried about I, my ability. I don't know to what's happening breathe. here, you guys. <laughs> like, what I the can hell? participate in there we go. gym class like normal kids. So I always had to have my inhaler on me. And to make matters worse, my middle school was less than a few miles away from one of the biggest refineries west of the Mississippi. In LA County, over half a million people live within a half mile of an active oil well. I'm sure we see Facebook on the screen. Like benzene is being. Yeah, the there's all kinds of issues happening right now, y'all. By environmental pollution, 92% are people of color. Living near oil production is deadly. I hope you can hear. The risk of asthma, nose I can turn this up a little. Issues, high risk pregnancy, and cancer. Neighborhood drilling is one of the most visible forms of environmental racism. So what are California's elected officials doing about it? It turns out Hollywood didn't build Los Angeles. The oil industry did. It began in the 1890s. And by the 1930s, California was producing a quarter of the world's oil. Starting around then, real estate developers used decades of redlining to force generations of black and brown communities to live in Okay, not only do we not hear this very well, but we're also not getting the actual video from it. And from the very beginning, oil companies knew they were poisoning people. In 1943, Okay, they're live streaming now, so you could probably actually go to their page to watch it too, but you won't get my commentary. Stating any exposure at all is dangerous. With about 5,000 active oil, Los Angeles County is the largest urban oil field in the U.S. And right next door to where I grew up is the neighborhood of Wilmington, which is 90% Latinx and surrounded by six oil refineries. Through years of hard work and organizing, we've been fighting back against environmental racism. Last year, Assemblymember Al Marasucci introduced Assembly Bill 345, which would have established buffer zones of 2,500 feet between oil and gas drilling sites and sensitive areas like schools, hospitals, and homes. But in August, state senators rejected AB 345 in a 5-4 vote. Three Democrats, Ana Caballero, Ben Hueso and Bob Hertzberg rejected the bill, continuing a long line of racist policymaking, taking money from big oil and standing against California. Hertzberg alone has taken tens of thousands of dollars from the fossil fuel industry. California prides itself on being an environmental leader, so why is it still legal to drill for oil next to our schools, our hospitals, our homes? You know, when your entire family has asthma, you, your brother, your father, when you find out that those flare-ups aren't just because of the DNA in your blood, it makes you upset and it completely alters your way of thinking. There was a purposeful connection between where you live and where fossil fuel industries decide to do business. I want you to be angry at your elected officials. I want you to let them know that they can't continue to get away with this. 
just because it is individually affecting me or a larger community of black and brown people doesn't mean that it's never going to get to you. But look at the, uh, by the way, did you see the quality of that video? That, that took a little bit of talent and money right there. Hey everybody. Um, thanks for uh, bearing with us. And if uh, you couldn't tell, that was Josiah Edwards, our soon to be uh, at large officer. So, uh, welcome. And hopefully, uh, thumbs up if the uh, transcription is working now. Is that uh, transcription coming on now? Okay, should be should be working okay now. For those of you who've been following me for a while, how many names do you recognize on the screen from various live streams I've done? Even, so again, uh, even in the comments. Uh, welcome. We've got a uh, busy uh, schedule here today, and uh, it's uh, things are a little bit different than uh, what we often do. In that, um, we're, this is officially a meeting of the Progressive Caucus Executive Board, and the reason we need to do that meeting is that it's the executive board who has the uh, authority to appoint at-large officers. So we had to have uh, this Don't meeting the, in order to get that little bit of uh, uh, bookkeeping, housework uh, done. So um, why don't we uh, start with just ratifying the agenda. And um, hopefully folks saw it when we mailed out the agenda a couple of times. Um, but uh, the agenda is for the officers, and it's uh, essentially the um, the appointment. Then we'll have officers reports. We're going to have a recall um, sort of summary, and we'll take a look at um, a direct action plan given the failure of the party on um, oil and uh, fossil fuel money. And then we'll wrap up with uh, announcements after we adjourn. And uh, we'll also give you an update on uh, the rules complaint against the caucus. So pretty low-key meeting, although we have some very important items to discuss. So I will ask one of the officers to unmute so that we have a motion and a second to ratify that agenda. So moved. Second. All right. And uh, I'll take it by acclamation unless there's some objection or amendment to the agenda. Hearing no objection, we will consider the agenda passed, and I'll move on now to um, at-large officers, the appointment of the at-large officers. So we have uh, discussed this uh, a few times, um, but just for those that might not have been with us, we um, just before the, the last election of the Progressive Caucus officers, we shuffled things around a bit and opened up three positions for at-large officers that are appointed by the elected officers. And we left those open because we felt that it, it was often the case that the executive board did not have some voices that need to be represented. And whether that's because of bias or just how the election goes sometimes, or that you know the election is hard for people to win, or maybe they didn't hear about it, whatever the reason, that we wanted to make sure that we had the appropriate diversity in identity and thought um, that made the caucus represent. So last time around, we introduced, introduced you to three great candidates, and uh, we're going to appoint them now. We have consensus in our uh, caucus executive board. Um, so I'll take first a motion and a second from our executive board members to appoint all three in one motion, and then we'll hear discussion from the executive board members and then we will vote. I'm sure it'll be by acclamation. And then we'll hear from those at-large officers. So, so first, the uh, motion from and a second from the executive board members for to appoint all three. So for those I'm moved and a second. second. Excellent. And um, for those of you who are uh, not familiar I'll, with I'll the process, say, as a discussion item uh, over the last month or more, the I regular body cannot vote. This is with, just the executive board Tanya members that are allowed to vote right now. We've been, you know, organizing behind the scenes and making trouble and getting 
together on the plans we're going to talk about a little bit later. So I can just attest to you that they are all troublemakers. They are fearless. They're ready to do the work, which is just as important. And I couldn't endorse them more for the at-large positions. And also they bring voices in that otherwise we might not hear. Um, if any one of the other caucus officers want to uh, speak to that, uh, this is your chance. And then we'll have our uh, vote. I guess I'll just take a few seconds to actually thank my fellow caucus officers for the process that we've gone through. Um, it was a little bit longer, I think, than we had thought it would be, but it's because we all took it so seriously, and I appreciate the thought that went into it, the people we considered, and all the time and passion, really. Um, I could not be happier to be a part of this board. So thank you. All right, anyone else want to be heard? I think Fatima, I will ask her to unmute. Yes. Oh, sorry, and I think my camera's not working. Sorry, one second. I'll just uh, talk with you for a second. No, I just wanted to say that um, uh, it's really important um, that we bring activism, you know, um, from, you know, different groups that have been doing the work on the ground into the Democratic Party. So that's kind of like why I'm really excited about these new at-large officers, because this is how we change the party from the inside out. It's when we have folks that have, you know, been doing work on the street. Um, you know, we need more of those types of folks in the party, the folks that have experience, like like Desire and that that you know, you just heard Desire to actually experience a lot of these things. We need these people in positions of power so that they can actually understand the urgency of these issues. I'm really proud of that large option. Thank you, Fatima. Any of the other um, board members want to be heard? If not, I see that Katie, our secretary, is here. So um, for this vote, just because it is sort of uh, important, let's do a roll call and uh, on the motion that's already So now we can see us. the roll call um, through Katie, the participants tab. Unmute and then call off the names of the officers and record their uh, vote, please. Oh, no, we can't. Oh, yes, we can. Yes. Yeah, so, Amr? They're not going to do it that way. Yes. Brandon? Yes. Fatima? Yes. Ben? Okay. Manuel? I don't know if he's raising his hands like that. I can't see him. There's like so many screens. I think Manuel is not here and Oh yes. Okay. All right. Um they're both excused. Okay. I'm here. Um Regina. Regina is also not. Here. Oh yeah, all right. Um Emma? Ah, uh, yes. Rico? Yes. Zach. Don't see that Zach has checked in yet either. Okay, Tanya? Yeah. Josiah? Yeah. Wait, hold Yvette? up. They're voting on their own appointments? Is that what's happening right now? The the potential people being appointed are voting so that's on... that's the end of the voting, but I see that Ben hasn't voted yet. Ben, are you there now? How, so how, are, there. how are the people yeah. who are being yes, appointed... What? Right, so, the, so that's all the officers. It passes. The only thing I will note, though, Katie, is that um, the three at-larges who... Um, made their opinion heard. They don't actually have votes until right now when we declare that the vote has passed. Right, exactly. <laughs> oh, like, what the hell? <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. Um, so, um, congratulations. You know what? I'm going to ask everybody to unmute and uh, congratulate our new three at large officers. Congratulations. Hard pass. Thank you, everybody, for all the love. I'm going to mute everybody, and then I am going to ask uh, Tanya. Um, why don't you um, share your share some thoughts with the uh, group? Hi, Progressive Caucus. Thank you so much for to the board and to the rest of the members to for 
allowing me to be a part of this awesome, really active and engaged group. I actually became a Democratic Party delegate because I didn't feel that um, Black and brown communities were participating in the process. We didn't have an opportunity. And at first, when I found out that we could actually be delegate, I was surprised. And when I went out to campaign, I told a lot of people that this was a process that we could participate in. And I was like, I'm going to help you guys understand how the Democratic Party works. But then as I learned more, I I came to understand that I'm just a little bit left of the party. Okay, I'm a lot left in the party. (laughs) And there's some things that I really wanted to see happen that I knew was important for a community. I'm from Oakland. And as you know, Oakland has some stuff going on and we're really active and we're really trying to change. And one of the things that we're trying to change is the footprint of police in our community, because our police department was a little faulty. We've been under jurisdiction for almost 20 years, federal jurisdiction, because they were racist and they were doing a lot of stuff to our community. And then, as you know, we're seeing that all across America now, that the light is being shined on how our policing system works and how things need to change. And so I'm really excited to be a part of this caucus because this caucus is really trying to fight to make sure change happens. And that happens with our legislature. And our legislature needs to be held accountable when they aren't doing what's for the community. So I'm really excited for an opportunity to act, to fight, to um, do some really great advocacy to create change within the party and within the legislature. And so I really appreciate this opportunity and I thank you all so much. I hope I can represent Oakland and Alameda County to the fullest and create the change. I hate this, the create the change that we all wanna see, but <laughs> that's what I wanna do. And so I'm gonna get the most out of my time here with the caucus and, and make sure that the things that I wanna see that Oakland wants to see is gonna happen at the state level. So thank you so much. Much appreciation to all of you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you for being with us. It's so awesome to have uh, you on board. I'm gonna ask uh, Josiah to come and share some remarks next. Sure. Um, like Tanya, I want to first thank um, the uh, caucus mem- uh, leadership as well as the membership. Um, you know, the, the work that's happening right now. Um, and frankly, our appointments couldn't happen without the recognition of, um, you know, the members of this caucus who are fighting to actually affect um, progressive change. I mean, that's what we need in our state legislature. That's what we need in the state in general. That's what we need in the country. And California will lead the way once we affect the change we, um, as Tanya said, um, the change and become the change that we want to see. Um, you know, crap, you guys. I became an organizer <laughs> oh because, well, you know what? I ain't gonna lie. I became an organizer because I was bored. Um, <laughs> I'd gone through a lot of transformation early on in college. Um, and, uh, I was presented with the opportunity to that. join as a youth organizer. <laughs> I'm going to open movement, that. <laughs> um, simply because of the work that they had been doing prior to that. Um, and now, I'm going to keep be that. I'll look at that later. You know, my you guys. boredom wasn't merely, wasn't uh, a sign of privilege. No, I grew up around, um, you know, refineries and, and, um, as a young black poor person, uh, I, I didn't have the, um, <laughs> oftentimes the privileges that a lot of younger folks are appreciated with or have um, when they oftentimes start organizing very earlier on. Um, I uh, didn't start organizing until I had the ability to do so. I was presented with the opportunity to do so because I was not worried or concerned at that moment in time about, you know, whether or not I would be able to pay rent or my family would be able to pay rent. I just had for once an opportunity to take some time and think about what I wanted to do with my life. And um, that's an opportunity that a lot of folks aren't presented with. Um, and so what I decided to do with that time was dedicate myself to organizing um, with Sunrise Movement and continuing to do so. Um, we know that you know, climate change is not simply an issue of um, climate anxiety and, and has often been 
um, perceived and frankly presented as a, a white issue. But the reality of the situation is, is that many black and brown communities suffer from environmental racism. The same people responsible for perpetuating the crisis we're in right now have long been causing harm to black and brown communities like mine. And that's part of the problem and why I'm so happy to join um, y'all in, in the Progressive Caucus and the Troublemakers Caucus, because what we know we got to do is start a little bit of good trouble to make some real change. Um, to take the mantra from John Lewis. We don't have much more time left in order to affect the change necessary for those of us who have been on the front lines of harm perpetuated by um, fossil fuel corporations, by executives, by, by law enforcement who continue to take advantage of our communities. The time for change is now, and I'm ready to make some change. So like the good sister and um, Senator um, Nina Turner says, hello, somebody, let's get to, let's get to work. Oh my God, that was so awesome. I'm asking everybody to unmute and uh, welcome. That's just energy there. Let's get to work. The troublemakers. Let's get to work. Let's get to work. The troublemakers. Yeah. I will literally vote for you for Love anything you ever run for. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Oh my God, so that's awesome. So um, I'm going to meet you all again. But I did want to say uh, something. We're going to have Yvette come on a little bit. She's moving today and she's got mobile. Um, sell. So we're, we're going to try to get her on for some remarks uh, when we can. Um, but what I wanted to say about the two uh, officers that we've heard from is, you know, the why it's so important that their voices are heard. And, you know, we, we heard from Tanya's in East Bay and Oakland, and she has a job in politics. And so often folks in that position put that um, job and protecting that job above everything else. Um, and Tanya hasn't. And she has said that she's willing to make some trouble, willing to do the work. And that is a relatively rare uh, quality. And I just appreciate the heck out of it. And um, regarding Josiah, I had an opportunity to go down to A64 and uh, with meet with him and with Fatima, who's running for assembly in that district. And I don't think you really appreciate um, the issues until you go to that district and you drive around a bit. And what you see is, um, you know, folks, young children living in an area which is freeway, 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 railroad track, oil refinery, oil refinery, oil processing, and then little chunks of neighborhood in between and all of this pollution just spewing in, we see, we see flares from those oil refineries regularly, which ups the pollution. And you have, you know, cancer and asthma and all sorts of health effects for people that don't have um, health insurance in many cases. And it's just, um, it's just so important to have Josiah's voice here with us. And I thank him for taking on this extra task in addition to all his organizing with Sunrise and in his community. And um, you know, this is why we're doing the work and why you all show up to, so that we can get the kind of change that will stop placing all of those burdens on the people that have the least options to avoid it. And um, gosh, um, we have a lot of work to do. We're gonna be getting in some trouble over the next month or two, but this is, yeah, yeah, you are. Why we're doing the work. And yes, <laughs> it is environmental racism, like Sherwin says in the chat. Um, so, so let's move on to the next uh, item on the agenda, which is um, a recap of the recall uh, from a, a progressive voice. So, Ben, I'll ask you to unmute and uh, talk a little bit about that. All right, there we go. So I think I must have done something wrong in order to get assigned having to talk about this damn recall because I know I am tired of it. I know most of us are tired of talking about the recall, but let's talk about a couple different points. Um, first of all, I wanted to kind of go back to the beginning prior to the, you know, some of the early stages of the recall. Um, the Democratic Party and Gavin Newsom really set us up in a situation that was extremely dangerous. Um, they basically set it up to where 
they made it very clear to any prominent Bible Democrat that if they ran in this recall election, they were going to get annihilated by the party. And in doing so, we didn't have any viable Democrat running as a potential replacement, meaning that the only possible option coming out of a successful recall was a Republican becoming that would have split the vote. Um, that is that stupid. Strategy, of course, ended up playing out and working, but it wasn't too long ago where the polling was dead even, and we had a very real possibility of having a Republican governor uh, of California. So, well, we most certainly would have had one had we done anything, that. But I think we need to take a real serious look on the left here at not allowing the party to put us in this position to where basically it's Gavin Newsom or bust, which is basically what they did. You know, they like to uh, point at the Bernie and bust movement. Um, they did the exact damn thing, where it was either we rally behind Gavin or we get a Republican governor. And so if we find ourselves in a position like this again, and hopefully there's going to be some reform to the California recall process, but if we find ourselves in this position, we need to take a long and hard look at potentially running a left viable candidate if we get into a recall position again like this. We would have um, lost. So we, would have, we would have lost to Republicans, uh, and that's their kind of entire purpose. The results. So far, it looks like it is going to be a blowout victory. I think as of Friday, it was 64 to 36 uh, to vote down the recall. Um, and as we expected, the uh, person who ended up getting the most votes as a replacement candidate was Larry Elder, who is a crazy right-wing nut job who thinks that... Uh, climate change is a hoax and who is an anti-vaxxer and an uh, anti-mask uh, candidate. Um, so clearly there was a big risk there. And it wasn't until people saw the risk of a potential Governor Larry Elder that uh, the polling started to really change. So when we look at it, I, I don't see that people necessarily were voting yes for Gavin Newsom. We were seeing more of a no vote to a potential disastrous Governor Larry Elder. Um, outside of that, what do we have coming up in 2022? We're going to have uh, an election for Governor Newsom. And traditionally, we've seen that uh, governors that go through, through these recall processes, if they are able to defeat the recall, they come back and win election, usually by a fairly wide margin. Uh, we even saw that with a pretty horrific governor, uh, Scott Walker. Uh, he had a recall effort against him, uh, which failed, and he came back and won re-election. He is obviously a fairly horrible uh, candidate and a horrible person in general. So heading into 2022, uh, many people might think that Governor Newsom is going to have an easy victory here. Um, but I do think that we need to take a long, hard look at running a viable candidate to the left of Governor Newsom, uh, not only to keep him honest, but also to try to win this election. Uh, Governor Newsom hasn't been all good. He hasn't been all bad, but he ran his campaign uh, promising that he was going to fight for Medicare for all, for single payer health care for California, and he has not held up his end of the bargain. Uh, he approved thousands of uh, oil wells for more drilling in California while our state is on fire. Yes, he's done some good things with the upcoming ban on internal combustion engines, and it, there's the ban on fracking coming up in 2024 for any new wells. So he's done some good things, but he's also done a lot of bad things. And I believe that we do need to challenge him uh, and see if we can defeat new That's things. That's simply not election. realistic. The, the election is uh, one year addition, out. I think we need to take a very serious look, and I know there's a lot of discussions already occurring about changing the recall process. Uh, the recall process where we can have a uh, minority of voters uh, vote in a, a re possible Republican candidate uh, is anti-democratic and many think it's not even constitutional. Um, so we need to take a hard, long look at some potential reforms. And I think that the left needs to get involved in these discussions to ensure that a recall process for California is something that is progressive and that uh, works for all of us. Yeah, these conversations and are already happening. The, can't forget that there are a lot of recalls occurring right now and a lot of recall processes across the state and in other states. And by and large, the people being targeted by these recall campaigns are leftists, our fellow progressives. Uh, we had a recall process that has just recently appeared to fail. 
uh, with the LA County District Attorney, George uh, Gascon. Uh, we've had a recall attempt against city council member here in Los Angeles, Mike Bonin. Uh, we've had a recall attempt also against city council member in LA, Nithya Raman. We've had the district attorney up in San Francisco, Chesa Bodine. Uh, and out in Seattle, we've had this recall process going against Seattle uh, city council member, Shama Sawant. So recalls are a very serious threat to leftists and Seattle doesn't matter to the California Democratic State Party. We should be focusing on California. The, um, Why not talk about Huntington Beach? Mike Bonin is uh, actually a very serious threat. He's one of the more progressive council members here in L.A., one of two who are very progressive. Um, so we need to rally around him. We need to support him and we need to defeat these recall processes. The MAGA Obviously, is trying to recall every single Democrat off of Democrats Huntington as Beach Governor Newsom got City in this Council. Process. So it's really up to the left to rally around these candidates and ensure that we defeat these dangerous recalls. Okay, but your focus um, so should be California. Do any of the uh, other um, progressive caucus members wish to bring up anything regarding the recall? Anybody want to discuss any issues here? Yeah, we're doing good on time. If somebody has a comment in a minute or two that they want to make, any of the officers or the attendees. And if somebody could... Shall I? Bring them up for a minute. Can we even raise our hands? I don't see anybody hands? with their hand raised, but Zoom... There's like, literally uh, people Alina with their hand, hand raised. Have their hands raised. And Isaac. And Isaac. Can There's... somebody bring him up on Spotlight then? Because my uh, Zoom is lagging up. I can't even raise my hand, y'all. <laughs> they only have it for officers. <laughs> the only uh, the hand raise option is not available to me. <laughs> can't even. They they do so much to silence their membership base. It's amazing. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, okay. It's your part then. Um, I agree. We just, I just want to agree with everything Ben said. Um, we have to, um, definitely hold Gavin Newsom accountable or, you know, um, or else, right? <laughs> or else we run someone else. But I also just wanted to thank everyone too, because I feel like, you know, like we rally you against the moderates as we should, in right? In the chat. party, but I think everyone came together, um, to defeat this recall, right? So I just wanted to thank everyone for any phone banking, um, canvassing, anything that you did, because um, you know, we could have had this Republican right wing governor and we don't, and Newsom is definitely not the best, but uh, much better than Larry Elder would have been. So just thank you for all your work. It's not easy when you need a grassroots sort of activism. So just want to say thank you. Is there another way to raise my hand? Reaction? All right, so if you can hear me, um, oh, there we go. I found it. Raised, there we go. Could somebody put them on uh, spotlight? We'll take one or two comments because uh, my Zoom is not working right. I believe Alina was next. Yes, because somebody put him on spotlight. Alina? Yeah. Alina. Yeah. So I have a question about, like, aside from Gavin, to go into more depth. Um, so there's voter registration, national voter registration coming up on September 28th. Do we have something in plan? Because I'm already working on events that uh, secure people, start registering voters. Um, is this something that the Progressive Caucus uh, is going to bring up about like the governor's race and the recalls that's uh, taking place everywhere. Um, definitely something I think we should be taking a look at. Uh, I know that the Progressive Caucus is definitely going to be very focused over the next couple of months on, of course, getting the fossil fuel money and police money out of the party. So that's going to definitely be a key focus. But yeah, voter registration is going to be critical and key. And uh, yeah, I'd love to see the Progressive Caucus get involved in that process. All right. And um, uh, who is who is the other person that had their hand raised when we uh, first asked? Next is uh, Isaac Lieberman. All right. So Isaac, we're going to take two minutes and then we'll move to the next item on the agenda. Of course. Hi. Um, Thanks for unmuting me. Appreciate it. Uh, so I love what you would, what you've been saying, Ben, Josiah, all, all you folks. The the um, the recall law obviously needs to be changed so that uh, an elected official is not going to be replaced with someone who refuse, receives fewer votes. 
But in addition, the entire process of holding randomly uh, scheduled special elections uh, for recalls is in itself a way for the Republican Party to um, undermine democracy and go around uh, an actual uh, high turnout election. So I believe that we should uh, require elections to be held on uh, a specified day that's always a holiday, most likely as the Constitution says, uh, this, the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. Every year we should just have that be the holiday and have elections. If special elections come up for recalls, whatever, they should have to be held on the same day. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Isaac. And thank you, Alina and Fatima for your comments. And uh, with that, I'll close out and thank you guys all for attending tonight. Thank you, Ben, for doing that, uh, that work. The unloved labor of talking about that. Um, and I do want to echo what uh, Fatima said, is that given the, you know, the tough situation we were in, as Ben described, so many progressives did the work and did the work maybe under duress, um, but you still did the work. And, and I want to appreciate those folks that did. And we, you know, when we did it to make sure that we got Trump out of the White House and, and we did it to make sure that we didn't get a Trump lover into the governor's office. And, um, I know that sometimes we don't get appreciated across the political spectrum, but I appreciate the folks, um, in this room that did that work. So thank you. Um, Yvette, are you with us now, our new at-large officer? Could somebody find Yvette for me? Yes, I am here. All right, so you may have missed Yvette. Sorry, put on spotlight, but Yvette, you missed that uh, there was a unanimous appointment uh, to bring you on as our new at-large officer. And then there was so much love from our attendees, and we thought we would hear from you for a few moments with whatever you want to do to introduce yourself or share. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for, you know, letting me speak at the end of the meeting. I really appreciate it. I'm going to turn on my camera really quickly and I do not look the best because I've been moving all day. But, um, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to, um, you know, serve the Central Valley and um, serve progressives, you know, statewide. Um, I'm really excited about the work we're going to be doing. We're going to be moving for the next couple of days and I just got a job with SEIU, so I'm very excited about that. Um, but yeah, I look forward to working with every single one of you. And if any of you uh, would like to reach out to plan some things, I, I would really appreciate it. I'll put my number and my email address in the chat box for y'all. But yeah, thank you so much, Omar. Thank you, Yvette. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm relying on my uh, caucus uh, officers now as I will um, always, but right now in particular, because I'm not getting any mouse response, although I can hear you and observe you well. So thank you to uh, whoever is handling the spotlight duties uh, in the background. But the next two items we're going to talk about are really key for the next couple of months and really to help define what the party means and what Democrats are for, uh, you know, you know, for California. Here we go, you guys. And now it maybe sounds melodramatic, but it really is the truth. We are what we do. And what we do uh, for decades is, you know, take police money while we say we uh, care about Black Lives Matter. We take fossil fuel money while we say we care about the environment. We take real estate money while we care about the housing, uh, housing crisis and on and on and on. And that money comes into the party, it flows through the party, it ends up supporting legislators that block all the bills we care about, whether it's police accountability or you know, fracking or you know, uh, housing funding. Um, just over and over again, uh, those bills just don't get passed. And you know, the last couple of sessions, it's really been highlighted that uh, the party is really just part of the problem. And I'm gonna take a little bit of time now to talk about sort of the recent history with uh, the party over you know, my term as uh, Progressive Caucus Chair and uh, CDP Chair Rusty Hicks term. And I've talked about these a little bit before, but I think um, for those of you that might not have heard, I'll try to, you know, I'll try to hit the main points so I don't bore the folks that have heard. But I think the important thing to note is that at the beginning of Rusty Hicks' term, 
he sat down with me and others and encouraged us all to work through the consensus building process in the party to go through committees, you know, reach resolutions that he would support those findings and that he was with us, you know, generally on the issues. So we did that. And Rusty set up an ad hoc committee and we talked about fossil fuel money in that committee and R.L. Miller, then chair of the uh, Environmental Caucus now, DNC member, um, fought hard to make sure that out of that committee, we got a prohibition on fossil fuel money. And that was the report that was given to Rusty. And we know that six days after that report, he took sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 from fossil fuel. And it didn't say oil, it didn't say uh, carbon, it said fossil fuel money. And he's admitted the money he took was from a fossil fuel corporation. And we also went through the, uh, the finance committee after George Floyd, and we got we went around the committee chair and got the committee members to put it on the agenda. We had a hearing with Black Lives Matter and other activists, and that committee came out with a recommendation, no more police money in the party. And after that, we saw some six-digit checks come from law enforcement organizations to the party, um, and luckily, there was an uproar, and the party didn't cash the checks. But what we know is that the, nobody sends a six-digit check um, if they don't think that they have a reason for it. I just don't believe that um, there was no understanding about what that money was uh, meant for. But thankfully, it wasn't counted. And what we've seen uh, is that uh, the party refuses to act on these committee um, consensus building operations and the committee reports, you know, 10, 15 page reports. And, and that alone is bad enough. But, you know, let's be clear, even if there was never a committee on fossil fuel money and there was never a committee on police money, it's just bad for the chair of the California Democratic Party to take that money if he believes in the things that he says he believes in, right? If the party has a platform and it says it believes in Black Lives Matter and the future habitability of the planet, we shouldn't be taking that money and it shouldn't require a committee and it shouldn't require a vote. That should just be um, how we operate. But that's not how it works. So what we asked, and this was um, back in July, right? So a few months back, um, we asked and gave notice to the party that exec as executive board members, we would like to have this issue discussed in the general session of the executive board. So just like your local club or your local central committee, the delegates have an opportunity to ask for something to be put on the agenda, and uh, we asked for that. And we ask, you know, not out of turn, but pursuant to the bylaws. The bylaws say that the executive board sets the agenda for regular meetings. And the response we got was that that's just never going to happen. If the party is never going to let the executive board bring a motion and set what's on the agenda, that is the chair's uh, uh, prerogative. And that's the way it's always been. That's the way it's going to be. And I asked, well, show me in the rules where it says that. And it's just not. And what we saw at the last executive board meeting is this came to a head where the chair of the Black Caucus, Taisha Brown, brought a motion saying that she would like to have this issue added to the agenda. And Rusty said it was out of order. And, it. and we saw the chair of the Environmental Caucus, Igor Atrego, bring this issue forward. He liked a uh, discussion on fossil fuel money in the, par in the party. That was ruled out of order. So the problem we have is that when the party says that it's not going to follow its own consensus building, it's not going to follow committee recommendations, it's not going to have a vote on committee recommendations, and when the members of the party ask to have something on the agenda, they're not going to put it on the agenda, they're not going to have a discussion. When all of that has happened, there really is no a good faith um, party um, discussion that's available to us. That what the party is saying, not directly, but by its actions, is that we don't care what you do in the party, all the doors are closed to you. And what's left is direct action. And now, you know, before we talk about direct action, you know, the issue that's brought up by those that um, you know, support the party leadership in stifling the voices of delegates is that look we're we're working on this new process 
and there's going to be a, a committee, and we're going to discuss it. And we should all just believe in the process. And if you believe in the process, you work on it, down the road we'll have some uh, good result. But here's the, the problem, and I think it's obvious to most, is that for a couple of years, we did work through the process, and it was ignored. And we have worked through the bylaw, and that was ignored. And it just isn't fair or reasonable to ask delegates who care about the future habitability of the planet and who care about the needless incarceration of our citizens. It's not fair to us to say, we'll spend the next six months and go through this process again, and maybe if you're lucky, we won't ignore it. It's just not reasonable, particularly when um, there's no uh, discussion, there's no outreach on how this process is going to unfold, who's going to be on this committee, you know, what their priorities will be. You know, we could very well reach a process five or ten months from now where those hand-picked people say, no, you know what, we're going to go ahead and take police funds. Or, no, we're like Joe Biden and, you know, we Didn't want to... Didn't he just say that they police, actually did uh, not take the money, though? Like, I'm, I'm our, confused Or, um, about we this. think that it's completely fine to continue to take fossil fuel money. And, uh, you know, a lot of legislators have come to us and they have said that it's really important that they continue to take that money because that's the only way we can elect Democrats. So if that's a possibility, that this whole process could be for nothing, and if we know that all of our good faith efforts over the last couple of years have resulted in nothing, it's really not reasonable to ask us to engage in the process yet again. Oh, here we go. And are. we have a consensus within our caucus board that we are going to seek direct action. Because what we know to be true is that the only time you actually get change in this country is when you put bodies in the streets. And that when you shame people, you force them to answer. This is how they're going to get the and caucus what we also totally know is decertified. The votes in this party are taken at the direction, sure, of party leadership, but they are real people. They are DNC members and party chairs and co-chairs and appointed executive board members and elected executive board members, and they deserve some pressure on this issue. If they are going to take this money and say that the party is going to take this money, then they deserve to answer for it. And in a world where uh, the chair can turn off the mic that, and we can't have a real discussion at our executive board meeting, what that means is that we have to go to where these people are. And that's what direct action is about. It's about putting bodies in the street. And um, with that, I'm going to now ask my colleagues to spotlight uh, Josiah and Fatima to talk about what direct action means going forward for the Progressive Caucus. And we hope that you will join us, yes, but also get the word out, help us organize. Um, it's going to be busy over the next two months as we uh, work on this, but it's not going to get done without you. And when I say without you, I mean... We need you to commit to the things that we like to yell about at Zoom and at our caucus meetings, um, to commit to the organizing that you do in your communities, but this time to direct it at party leadership and party infrastructure to get the party to change. Because what we know is that it's not going to change on its own. It's going to have to be us. So with that, uh, Josiah and Fatma, I'll let you talk about direct action. So make it spotlight yeah. now. I'm going to give it mostly to Josiah. What I, um, I'll just say is that um, just as a general overview, we're going to have our actions in SoCal, the SoCal region happening first. And, you know, we're going to um, have it, you know, region by region. But the SoCal actions are, are coming up soon. Um, so ben and I are going to talk about our meeting next week. And that meeting is pretty much going to be like what actions um, are going to be happening. At the very least, we're going to have you sign up if we don't have definite dates set in stone yet. But with that, I'll pass it on to Josiah. He is um, the activist on the ground working with all the organizations and can uh, like to give more details there. Sure. Thanks, Fatima. Um, I want to go back to something Amir said a, 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 a while ago, um, specifically relative to the fact that every time these discussions get brought up relative to um, taking fossil fuel money or taking law enforcement money, what ends up happening is they get 
processed. They get put in committees. We get reports. We get a variety of things that never actually get real results. And the chair never acts on it. The executive board never really acts on it, in, in part because a lot of them take their directions at the behest of the chair, um, Rusty Hicks. Um, and so one thing that Amr brought up was just that, you know, the reason they get, or that they get processed and, and put aside and that we, we can't wait for that to happen anymore, in part because these crises are so bad. But I, I also want to second that and also put an alternative reason to why this is so, so much of an issue. It's not simply because the crises are so bad, but it's also because the people who are affected by those crises have long been affected by them. Any attempt to wait, um, to set things aside, to process them, um, that is negligence. It's, 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 it's ignoring the reality that a lot of communities like mine, a lot of black and, black and brown communities um, suffer from. Um, whether it be the climate crisis or law enforcement. And so that's really what's brought us to this point, which is that we cannot allow ourselves to continue to enable um, the failure of our party's leadership, whether it be within the party as party officials or elected officials, which is why we have to change institutions. And that starts with this institution, the California Democratic Party. Um, you know, it... I've already told you really about how this is uh, the reason or the, the impetus for this happening. But um, let's be very clear. It's not something that it's not just us, you know, saying we're going to take some degree of action. We're, we're very clear that this action is going to happen. Um, so I want to give you all a little bit of a better idea about what that might look like. First of all, it is going to be on a statewide basis. It's not just going to be secluded or, or, or sectioned off to one particular region. If we want to affect any genuine change, it's going to happen have to happen on a statewide basis. And on top of that, that means that party officials can no longer sit comfortably in their nice little houses as they rub elbows with power. No, no, no. That means we need to actually make them uncomfortable because we've been uncomfortable for too long, right? We've continued to breathe in toxic air. We've been continued to have um, the, the boots of police on the necks of black and brown folks, right? Um, so that means that they're going to have to experience some of the uh, uncomfort and discomfort we experience daily for the entirety of our lives. Uh -oh, um, and so that's the next here? thing, which is that we're going to make them uncomfortable. What that looks like is, uh, you know, waking some folks up, right? Um, and so uh, <laughs> I'm not going to go a little specific beyond uh, any specific, any more specific. Sounds like the there, Maria Estrada it's, it's form of protest. I think you get the gist. Um, on top of that, uh, that means that we're going to be working with partners beyond just the Progressive Caucus, right? That means we'll be working with allies. You see my shirt on, right? Um, I represent Sunrise everywhere I go. And that means Sunrise is going to continue to put in the work um, to make sure what we, what we did to put the Green New Deal on the map, what we did to elect Green New Deal champions, what we did to elect a bunch of um, people who would actually champion the Green New Deal, we're going to apply the same sense of pressure, the same sense of urgency, the same efforts we did there to make sure that our party reflects our values. Um, so that's the next thing. Um, the goal, of course, hold on, I keep getting called. Um, the goal, of course, in all of this is to ensure that the California Democratic Party is never taking a single dollar from corporate executives who are, um, who are uh, connect directly connected to the fossil fuel industry. And on top of that, that the party will no longer take law enforcement money. Um, as we saw the uh, summer of uprisings that happened in 2020. It's time to take the calls and cues from um, activists and organizers on the ground, and more importantly, the people who this party claims to represent. Um, so um, as Amr said, for the next two months, y'all will be seeing a lot. Um, and uh, I want y'all to be prepared. Um, this is going to be very important because the goal is, and we expect to, have this goal accomplished is to have people look in the eyes of people who have been affected by fossil fuel, um, you know, uh, injecting themselves in our communities by, by law enforcement, um, victimizing black and brown folks. I want you to look me in the eye as you say that I am not going to vote um, to support you and your community, that I am going to vote instead for racism and environmental racism as opposed Did to Did any of you actually submit a resolution to the resolutions um, committee so or that's kind of the gist of a, a bylaws um, change to the bylaws <laughs> on committee? Longer, but I hope y'all get the idea. Did you seriously um, try and get things tabled right at the top at the general session or Thank did you, you actually uh, work through I'd the committee? I love it. I love the energy. Uh, Father, was there anything you wanted to add or should I uh, uh, wrap this uh, portion up? Good to go? Okay, so... Um, 
Let me just add, man, before we get the officer reports, just to wrap up this bit, uh-huh. uh, a little peek behind the scenes um, from over what's been happening just the last few days, last week or so, is that knowing we had this meeting coming up and that we had a direct action plan that we're rolling out, I sent a, a very, what I thought was low-key uh, email to DNC members and uh, the chair and co-chairs of the rules committee. At, you know, laying out the context, what had happened. Mind you, Maria Estrada did this to Rusty Hicks a year and a half and ago. And asked them to take a position on fossil fuel money in the party and uh, law enforcement police money in the party. And we got some who responded right away, said, I'm with you 100%, sign me up. We also got a bunch of DNC members that were just responding in tone policing, saying, why are you so aggressive? Um, I'm with you in concept, but we need to go through the process. Um, you know, Chair Hicks has said he's going to set up a committee. And uh, why are you guys doing this now? We just, I, I see got a lot of this. The recall has just ended. Because it it's so distraction hour. Uh, why are uh, you doing this right now? And um, I got to tell you, it's just, it was just so disheartening, but yet completely expected, right? Whenever we, try to push these issues forward, we always get excuses. You said the they didn't take right. the police money and, and he took 60K different. of and you fossil fuel. And you just do this first. You're not saying it right. If you just say it a different way, if you use a different methodology. But here's what we know. It, it doesn't matter whether we are dying in the streets or our siblings are being poisoned in their water or their air is being polluted. It always seems to be the people that have the least options are asked to take the greatest burdens and asked to wait. And Josiah comes from a community which is exactly that. And that's why you can feel the passion through the internet um, about you know what he's trying to fight for. He's fighting for his community. And we have folks with immense privilege in the party who quietly cast these votes and refuse to do the right thing and say, go through the process again, do the committee again, you know, please try to build consensus again. And I can just tell you, I have Immense no privilege, y'all. patience for that. All the fucks I ever had have been exhausted. I am not going to wait. And we have consensus in our board. We are not going to wait because there's no promise that they will do anything different a couple of weeks from now, or a couple of months from now, or a couple of years from now. We have to put bodies in the streets to get this done. And this is a call to action for all of you, that we are gonna roll out these dates and get more specific and give you places um, and people around the state that we are gonna protest, and we're gonna need you there. There's more. Look at all these degrees, you guys. Look at all these. Look at all so these. Look at all, these. Look at all it's that. It's not gonna get done unless we all do it together. Not I mean, me, come on, us, dude. And we will get this done. We will change the party because we are going to do the work. Because that's the only way things ever get done. So um, thank you for your patience. Um, I'm going to move now to the officer's reports. Um, Brandon, with the uh, our Bay Area Vice Chair, with your report first. Thank you. Great. Uh, I feel like going after, after you dropped all that news, uh, uh, it's so hard, Amr. Now I'm just gonna be on. Oh, God, I'm going to give a report. <laughs> it's you know, it's just kind of a, a funny thing. Uh, hello, folks. Uh, my name is uh, Brandon Parami. He, him, his. I am your Bay Area Vice Chair. Uh, very thrilled to be here. Just gonna get my notes up. I have a few things to report on. Um, you know, first off, Yom Kippur to everyone who celebrates. Um, thank you to uh, the folks who reached out. Uh, part of the reason we switched <clears throat> switched the date is is that was flagged. Uh, and I just want to appreciate the folks who flagged it. We're going to be more mindful about when we decide when our meetings are, uh, and much appreciation to you. Uh, here in SF, we kicked off the Autumn Moon Festival, uh, which happens a couple blocks from my house, which is absolutely lovely. So, uh, I hope that people will come and join us out here in the Richmond for that. And then, uh, you know, happy Oakland Pride to everyone who celebrated as well. Uh, we had a lot of fun events in the Bay, and it's nice to be able to be out masked and vaccinated seeing you all again. Just want to let you know a few updates from the Bay Area. 
the 2018 special election uh, is over. Uh, Mia Bonta was uh, the winner of that special election. Um, uh, you know, congratulations to everyone who's involved, everyone who supported, regardless of the candidate you supported, like, you know, congratulations. And, and you know, the party took a stance. So, you know, if you have your own individual stance. We're going to you know, take a break uh, during the officer reports. And send some love your way. Uh, I will say that uh, we did work very hard in advance. To make they're sure they're going to push this to the very end of the meeting because they, they really don't want to talk about it. They do um, not want to talk about their own financial scandal. They want to deflect all the blame onto um, party officials. And quite frankly, what they just described in this meeting is that uh, they're saying basically that Rusty Hicks took $60,000 of fossil fuel money. I don't know what that means. I don't know who the donor was. I don't know what that is. But they also then made an allegation of taking money from um, uh, police officer unions, but saying that the check was offered, but they didn't actually take the money. So what does that mean then? So what if the if if police officer unions try to offer money and it was rejected, then that's a moot point. That doesn't fucking matter. But the reality is that they're deflecting right now because they're in trouble. They are uh, provisional status at this point, and if they don't follow the remedies that they were given, they will be decertified as a caucus. And while they're talking about being silenced by the party, they do the exact same thing to their own membership base and to other progressives in the community. And that's what's going on right now. So, um, basically, <laughs> I can't even with this. This is also broadcasting on their own Facebook page. I'm just giving you my own side commentary. I'm going to take a smoke break while we're doing this. Um, I don't get any tobacco money, but I do spend money on tobacco. Let's go. All right. So, um, Brandon Harami, the guy who's speaking right now, he is part of Our Revolution California. Um, Karen Burnell has a stronghold in Our Revolution throughout the California network. Um, Emma Jensen is also with Our Revolution California. She's also like, she's their par parliamentarian. She's, uh, she's also a, an officer with uh, Feel the Burn, Orange County. Um, I don't, Amr wants to run for assembly. Fatima wants to run for assembly. These people all have ambitions beyond their actual roles as troublemakers within the progressive caucus. And so the idea that they are somehow in the, I mean, you, I, you saw me zooming in on Amr's, uh, credentials there is he had all of his, I don't even have my bachelor's degree up behind me when I'm doing my live streams, but he had like all of his, all of his degrees up and, you know, talking about privilege. Yeah, dude, how much did your fucking education cost? That looked like it was a couple hundred thousand dollars at least there hanging on your wall. <laughs> that was a pretty expensive education you had there hanging on, on the wall behind you. So anyway, um, I'm still waiting for them to address the money scandal that they've been pretending like it didn't happen. Um, by the way, okay, so this whole idea that you can't just get somebody, they're, they're like, oh, Rusty keeps shooting down our ideas. Well, how are you presenting your ideas to him? Are you following actual Robert's rules? Are you f going through the process? Because I know that when we try and do stuff at the local county party, we first have to, like, if we want a resolution, we have to first go to the resolutions committee and submit it there. Participate, make public comment. And uh, I've never had a fucking problem. I've, I've done two of them now so far, and I've participated in several other uh, resolutions committee meetings, giving some feedback in the chat, uh, the Zoom chat, to let people know, like, what my thoughts are on the, gramma the grammatical spelling, like, the grammar of what they're presenting and whether or not there might be some concerns behind it. So I, I try and do the best I can to influence in the chat on those resolutions committees. That's for my local county party. I don't really, I've only attended one CDP meeting. It was a, um, it was a rules one and it was because of this caucus. The caucus was being, um, they were trying to determine whether or not they wanted to recommend that the caucus be set to provisional status. And I did attend that meeting. They know how this goes, you guys. They are relying on their membership's ignorance. They are relying on their membership's ignorance to be like, we're just not getting put on the agenda. 
You know exactly how to get on the agenda. You guys are not trying hard enough. You guys are being performative. This is some bullshit. The uh, actual meeting, the actual meeting broadcast is on their own page, but the broadcast that I'm giving you has my commentary as well as the chat, which you won't see on their page, and a partial snapshot at the attendees list. You can't get that on their page. <laughs> I'm keeping a listen. I'm keeping an ear out. They also, if you'll notice, okay, so uh, one thing he said is we'll take a couple of comments. They're absolutely not following Robert's rules because in a normal meeting, when you have motions, um, well, normally, okay, so normally you wouldn't have like everybody at the eboard meeting. This is their executive board, right? Normally you wouldn't be here, but you wouldn't only just take a couple of comments. You would actually set a time frame for it. You'd have like two minutes of time for, two minutes of time against, and you'd um, have some predetermined speakers in advance uh, speaking for and against what they were discussing. That's normally how it goes. Amr and Emma, who's the parliamentarian, are not following Robert's rules and they're not running these meetings properly. But normally you would have for and against arguments and then you would go to a vote of whoever is eligible to vote. So in the case of this meeting, it would be the executive board is eligible to vote, but you would have your speakers for and against. That's not how he's doing it and that's not how he's done the other meetings that I've attended either. This guy does not know how to run meetings. For however many degrees he has hanging on the wall behind him, he does not know how to run these meetings. Lord Almighty. They, they said they're going to stick to a strict 90-minute schedule. I certainly hope so. It's a Saturday night, right? Let's see where they are. I might come back. I might cut short. If they don't get to get to the point, they you know what? They're going to get to it like right at the very freaking end. They're going to wait until the very end of the meeting and it's going to be like a throwaway comment. Oh, God, I hate this. I hate unaccountable people. I hate it when people act like they're fucking saints while they're shitting on the people around them. I hate that so much. Um, you know, our folks, All right, let's go. State, um, as a on fossil fuels. Um, just want to share some quick uh, legislative updates just on two bills, and then I'm going to pass it on to Arlena from San Diego. Um, you know, unfortunately, the Vision Act was not brought to the floor for a vote, so that is not good for our immigrant community. Very, very important. SB2, the decertification bill, is at the governor's desk. He actually got it when I looked it up on September 13th, so he hasn't signed it yet, to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong. So we got a pressure to sign SB2. It is, uh, you know, according to like progressives like Alex, we pretty watered down, unfortunately, but it's, you know, we are one of four states that didn't have a decertification process, and at least we have something now. So let's push our governor to sign that. Here's something that's really awful. Not many people have been talking about this, this last bill I want to mention, but AB 1395. It was a bill that would have enshrined in state law a net zero greenhouse gas emissions target by 2045. That former Governor Jerry Brown set by executive order. It also would have gone further by specifying that 90% of the reduction had to come from human caused activity, limiting the use of direct air capture and using force and other land to offset industrial emissions. Here's the awful part about that. So I, I don't want, because we're fighting fossil fuels and law enforcement, so I want to bring this bill up. It was placed in the inactive file. So it, 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 it passed the Senate, it passed the Assembly. And it's not going to the governor's desk because it was placed in an active file. So just know, when we talk about our state legislature, we talk about our governor, this would have been a you know a great bill, a great goal because we're already behind um, you know on on our goals with the climate crisis, and now we have no chance again this legislative session of actually having a goal to transition California away from fossil fuels. So be angry about that. All right, I'm gonna do it. Um, there is a SoCal regional meeting that we're gonna have. Um, on September 23rd. Um, Ben's going to talk more about that. I just want to like amplify that date. Please, please, we need all the SoCal members there. Direct action only works when people show up. So, you know, like we really need y'all to show up. We really need y'all to see the importance of, as Amar talked about, this is what we've come to. So we need bodies, right? So please, please come to that meeting so we can tell you the details 
and you can participate. Um, and now I'm going to pass it on to Alina um, Rabi, who's going to give a San Diego regional, effort, a regional report and talk a little bit about, about Afghanistan for a couple of minutes. And then Alina, if you could pass it on to um, Ben after that. Thank you. Go ahead, Alina. Hey, everyone. My name is Alina Junawabi. I live in San Diego. Uh, so San Diego is very special because it has one of the largest immigrant communities as well as being uh, international borders. Um, I'm going to talk about three things. Uh, private prisons, we have an issue with that because uh, even though President Biden has said that he's no longer going to uh, support private prisons and he wants to put a stop to funding it, However, we find out recently that uh, private prisons are going around by subcontracting themselves through regional uh, support. So we're hoping that our progressive caucus can actually prevent that and put pressure on their state representatives to make sure that they're not being subcontracted. Also, going back to Vision Act, she mentioned, we have to make sure that Truth Act, which is one of the other forms that's going from county to county, we have to make sure there is no ICE there's no transfer between ICE and um, and uh, our, our prison system. So we can still put uh, that, that pressure, even though Vision Act doesn't pass. Uh, the second thing is the drone technology. San Diego has this huge issue with uh, surveillance. And this is also impacting uh, activists, because uh, most of the activists, when they were doing the protest for BLM, in support of that, they were actually surveilled, their privacy was taken, and they were shared on social media by police departments, and they were harassed afterwards. So we want to make sure things like drone technology doesn't come into your uh, uh, neck of the woods. Unfortunately, San Diego did pass it, but we're hoping to at least stop the bleeding from here. And then the last thing is the Afghan evacuation. Even though the evacuation deadline has passed, we are still working with a lot of the Afghans who are in Afghanistan. Um, these are special cases, people who are in detrimental uh, situations. They want to come over here to pursue their education with safety, dignity, and uh, in a very, very safe environment. Uh, we want to make sure this is being uh, supported because after all, we can't do much at this point to the Afghan, for the Afghan people, right, in Afghanistan, but we can still support a lot of Afghans who are currently here in the uh, United States. For example, my trip to El Paso, uh, Texas, I went in there and I saw like what was happening. We're hoping that all of you can apply some pressure on uh, Governor Newsom. I know he is supportive, but a little bit of more pressure to make sure that we receive all of these, uh, you know, immigrants because California is a lot more friendly compared to other states and we're hoping that if we can absorb those immigrants we can create a more inclusive environment for people who have been impacted by uh, decades of war. So yeah, um, I am going to leave my information in the chat. There are other issues that I'm working on, not only Afghan evacuation because I'm still working on that. I'm also working on uh, women's rights, children's rights, uh, to education, so please contact me. Uh, contact me if you're interested in um, collaborating on these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Alina and Ben for uh, Southern California. All right. So, um, as much as I don't want to talk more about the recall, I do want to talk a little bit about the two recalls that are a serious threat here in Southern California. There are more than two, but I want to highlight two. Uh, first one, which I mentioned previously, was Mike Bonin, city council member here in Los Angeles. Uh, the recall effort, there's been a doubling down on it. Uh, there's been a lot of activity. There's a dark money group, uh, which has opened up a pack, and they are going to be increasing their spending pretty dramatically on this recall effort. So this is a serious threat. Uh, I'm going to drop a link really quick in the chat on that if you want to and can support Bonin on this. Uh, it's going to be very important to do so. Uh, the other one is George Gascon. Um, even though the initial attempt failed, they are uh, reportedly going to rebrand and revamp and restart the process. Um, so as we know, you know, he's an extremely progressive DA. Uh, he's doing a lot of outstanding work and we need to have his back. So as more information comes out about that, uh, be ready to uh, stand up and take action and support him. A small piece of good news, uh, which is rare these days, but uh, Los Angeles County supervisors actually voted last week to ban drilling in unincorporated areas of LA County, uh, and that includes thousands of wells. And it could actually lead to an eventual shutdown of a massive 
uh, site of oil drilling, which a lot of people have seen in the Inglewood oil field. Uh, so this could be huge news for LA County, could really be uh, a model for leadership for other counties and for states in terms of uh, ending the fossil fuel industry and a just transition. There were two other motions that were also passed. One is about the closure and cleanup of existing wells. Obviously, as we know, a lot of the fossil fuel companies just like to leave their wells uh, and leave the pollution and everything that happens, especially in communities of color. Uh, so there will be a process for that to occur. And then last but not least, uh, there was a motion to expand a task force on a just transition for EJ communities and for uh, workers in the fossil fuel industry. So a little bit of positive news, but we are going to have to stay on top of the LA County supervisors ensure that these motions turn into action. And then last, just want to once again uh, let people know, as Fatima mentioned earlier, uh, the Southern California region will be having our meeting uh, this coming Thursday at 7.30 p.m. We will be sending an out, out an email invite to everybody in the Progressive Caucus. Uh, we'd love to have everybody from the Southern California region attending, but anybody across the state is welcome to come. and. It, Invite your friends, invite your family members. People do not have to be caucus members to join us. Uh, the meeting is open to all. And we will be discussing some upcoming direct actions uh, around the fossil fuel money and police money. So we need everybody to join us on these direct actions. We're gonna be causing some good trouble. We're gonna be doing some wake up calls for our leaders in the party who are actively working against the people and we need everybody to show up. So thank you, Solidarity. And we'll see you out in the streets. Thank you, Ben. By, By the way, he's from Long Beach. Uh, he lives from, 10 oh. minutes away from Huntington Beach where they are recalling okay, so, all recall of the, night. they're trying to recall election. all You're of the so Democrats on Carso Huntington County. Beach City Council. And he didn't Carso mention County anything County going on in Orange County. No on the recall of he's like 10 County. minutes away, y'all. Just to wake up the next morning and actually find out that, no, it went the other way. And Fresno County voted to recall Gavin But here's what's important. 47% voter turnout. We knew it was going to be low, but Republicans in the area here actually have voter turnout as up to 80%. They were going to turn out. So the Democratic vote actually pulled out enough to show that Democrats are getting stronger in Fresno County. The city of Fresno has a city council in which it's all Democrats except for the mayor and one council member. Other areas are turning blue in Fresno County. We know this because the Republican Party is doubling down on Trumpism. They are trying to recall city council member Jewel Hurtado in Kingsburg just for trying to bring up the pride flag during pride month at city hall. They're going to lose these races. We've got them on their heels, but we can't forget the push here and the fight. Okay, and a little bit about, about Central California. For communications, I actually want to highlight a little bit more about what Ummer said in terms of our direct action coming up and, and a little bit about messaging. You know, one of the key takeaways about all this in terms of why we're so passionate about this issue with fossil fuel money and law enforcement money in our party, believe it or not, we did something we normally don't do. We behaved. We followed directions. There was a committee that made these recommendations. And when that didn't go through, we waited for the officer elections. We talked to the officers. And so to have another subcommittee get put in there for these things to die is a slap in the face. That's why we are troublemakers. Not but because we want to, but because they make us have to when they do not behave. It kind of feels like they're that actually watching my live stream right now, right? Forward. Each and every one of us here on this call and every single one of our allies going forward. I heard Senator Bernie Sanders talk about the price tag on the infrastructure bill, asking if it was too expensive or needed to get due to bring it down so Manchin will pass it. What do you mean too expensive? What price can you put on this earth? At what point is saving money when the planet's going to die and there's nothing left at all? If anything, we're going to regret not spending enough Show me money the resolutions. Show me your, pro your proposals for topic, bylaws changes. Case, we're going to regret not putting pressure on our own party to make sure the right thing happens when more of our young people who still don't have a voice in their entire system see the repercussions of everything happening here. So whether it's social media, when you're out on the streets, on Zoom meetings now, the way the world's operating, that is the message you have to take. Keep that fire in your heart because if we don't do it, nobody else will. We're not troublemakers because we like stirring trouble. 
We do it because other people are making us do it. Be courageous. Don't forget, Martin Luther King only had a 16% approval, rate, approval rating when he was alive. You will be thanked when you do what is on the okay, right side. Okay, but he also didn't have illicit right. pack money, so are you guys okay, going to address that? Right Katie, our secretary. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Rico, for bringing the fire. Let's hear from Katie. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Yeah, I have no um, officer updates, but something to shine a light on is trees. Um, like recent, recently, with all the fires going on, it's been very upsetting that, like, um, with how the state's handling like the fires for like the past several years, um, and shining light into my own city and everything, like um, there there needs to be systemic change happening with how like local city councils are operating, especially with like cutting down trees, like maybe possibly even hundreds of um really old and grown trees, um, but not replacing them, but instead of replacing them with buildings, but planting like little to no trees at all which is definitely very heartbreaking um, to our environment. I mean, yes, buildings and infrastructure is great, but when the infrastructure is not even built sustainably, or even when you're cutting down trees, it's like you're replacing it with something that's not even like functional for like the everyday um, lives within our communities. So that's what's been happening with my city in of Alhambra. But besides that, like stay hyped and stay focused of all the future actions going on in the Progressive Caucus. And I'm oh, so excited to make the trouble with you all. Thank you, Katie. Um, we are going to hear from Emma, our parliamentarian, and then we have a special guest council member just before we wrap up. Hi. Sorry, I'm not on Hi, video. Katie. I too am moving and am sort of having no internet in my new apartment at the point, so I'm on my phone. Um, if someone could please share the um, rules change document, uh, that would be awesome. And Amr, are we voting on this today, or is this just second read? No, we have to do uh, the vote at a full At the general, at general session, uh, general meeting, got it. Okay, so yeah, if someone will please... Um, share the document because I cannot do that from my phone. <laughs> All right, why don't you continue and we'll try to get that done. I'm not sure if anybody... Okay, so, okay, so let me go ahead and open it up then. Um, I went to the chat. Sorry, I thought it was going to be up. Um, this is going back to the, um, the agreement that we uh, made with the uh, uh, rules committee regarding our um, little pack spending that was really just on ADAC is calling for accountability in party episodes. Um, but again, we did like the bylaws, uh, and so I presented this at the last meeting. Um, and I'm trying to pull it up now. I'm oh, literally not going to uh, argue idiots in the chat right now. I've been going up to the this. Sierra Nevada since I was, I was three. <laughs> God damn it, you guys. There we go. This is the parliamentarian, uh, by the way, who's doing this giggling bullshit. Fuck sake, Emma. A couple language. Um, and that, um, this is in a standing order to pass, which is simply procedural. It's not a bylaws amendment. Um, the language for that is any motion, resolution, or other effort to endorse or provide other material support of any kind to a, it said person, and um, that we are changing that word to candidate other than the officially endorsed candidate of the California Democratic Party or the nominee of the California Democratic National Committee, the president, vice president, um, is out of order and shall not be considered. So basically, if you bring it up, Honor will have to rule it out of order. Um, uh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rico. Um, and then uh, the main amendment, and this is the required language from the Rules Committee, so we are putting it in. And that's a little bit redundant. That's fine. Do you want to play nice? Maybe they'll play nice. Um, and that is under Article 2, Organization Section A, Relationship to the Democratic State Central Committee, which is the California Democratic Party. Um, we are adding uh, 
a section. So instead of number two being failure com to comply with Article 11, that section is now uh, subsection three. And we are adding a subsection two. The caucus will not form, maintain, contribute to, materially support, or otherwise materially participate in the governance, fundraising, or expenditures of any political committee other than the California Democratic Party. Basically, right. we have to spend our money on caucusness. Fine. And we will. Uh, so consider the second read. We will vote on this at the next um, general meeting. And unfortunately, we're not going to, we don't take any feedback on this one because it is required by the party. So that it's is my so report. crazy that they're not saying why um, they have may to do I this. Just real quick. Yeah. On the subject, can we just um, maybe because we had our meeting, uh, our last meeting, and then we had the incident at eboard, the incident, and we haven't had a chance to like actually in person explain. Um, I was just hoping that maybe you can just real quick explain why what was said at eboard. Somebody's monitoring my live stream. And yeah. How maybe some of the stuff that we pushed on them led to them using that as an attack against us because i think that's really important that we're transparent with the rest ah, of the ah, the ah, caucus of, and which we have been but we Brandon, be i did attend the meeting before the last OB meeting OB. like i literally attended the, yeah, the meeting before that idea. okay so why don't we bring on a special <laughs> guest Katie, <laughs> council member katie valenzuela from sacramento and then I will uh, lay out some tea regarding what was really going on. Some tea. Uh, with reference to the executive. Dude, order I attended the meeting. And um, all that stuff. So, okay. um, let's bring on Katie, Council Member Katie Valenzuela from Sacramento. Um, what I want to say first is that Katie is progressive as fuck. And she's an amazing organizer. You guys and she has over a, 90 minutes, a by substantial the way. connection to what's actually going on in her community, and that's why she unseated an entrenched incumbent who took money from all the wrong places. And she um, launched a you know corporate-free, law enforcement-free campaign focused, among other things, on housing in the community. And she connected, and that's why she won. And it was an amazing victory here in Sacramento. But it's it's real nice that she's able to stop by and talk to us for a little bit because you know we've been talking about recalls in different parts of the state and what's happening now in her district is something that has happened in a few other places is that it's not just Republicans who are taking advantage. Oh of my God! The recall Can you just talk about what actually fucking happened? Like, do we need to? I can't even, you guys. Good Democrats um, using you know whatever means are available to them. It's also Democrats. That are doing this. Democrats that can't win a general election oh are now God, trying Lauren, to take advantage I really want to, of like, bullshit I mean, special elections so they can defeat good progressive Democrats when they get elected. Can I and we all need to wake up to that a little bit. And I'm going to let um, Councilmember Valenzuela explain exactly what's been happening over the last few days because we need to support these folks um, in these um, off. A schedule elections, whether they're in San Francisco okay, gonna, or statewide like for government or now coming watch. up, possibly in Sacramento. So, uh, Councilman Valenzuela, Katie, thank you so much for being with us. I'll let you take it from here. And let's make sure somebody could unmute before we leave. Yeah, I, I can't do it if somebody could do it. Oops. Can you hear me? All right, if somebody could unmute. There we go. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Amr, <laughs> uh, for letting me come on today. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, you know, I'm Katie Valenzuela, born and raised in Oildale in Kern County. Um, since I moved to Sacramento, I spend a good deal of my time working with amazing folks like Josiah and Riddy and others on frontline community policy in Sacramento. You may remember me as one of two people who was infamously named by Senator Hertzberg from the Senator from the Senate floor on AB 345, um, right before he voted no. 
know, because he was really mad we were there to push him to vote yes. Um, but the other part of my time is spent being a Sacramento City Council member, and we've gotten a ton done. Um, from day one, we were pushing on protest response policies for SAC PD. Um, you know, we've been bringing up motions to defund the police, to move money to interventions. We have saved child care. We have worked on transportation and zero emission buses. I mean, we've changed homelessness response in Sacramento by creating safe grounds and places that people can actually be um, so that they aren't harassed by police and able to be safe at night. Um, and because of all of that, yesterday um, we learned that there's a push pull out on us. Um, I'm going to put a link in the chat to uh, email announcement I sent. If you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see a sample of one of the questions in which they call me, and I quote, a sloganeering bomb thrower uh, like Katie Valenzuela, which might need to be one of our new titles besides troublemaker. But um, we've heard today um, that at least one consultant has actually been approached. And so we're taking this very seriously. Obviously, as you all know, it's a trend around the state. Um, it's something that we as progressives, especially those who don't take corporate money, are at a natural uh, deficit because I haven't been fundraising. I've been focused on doing the work. I think I've got a couple grand in my campaign account right now. Um, so obviously we need a lot of help um, if we're going to defeat back these measures and would really appreciate support and attention in Sacramento. We've been working so hard with Sunrise, with ACE, with others to really build political power. We just beat back an over $1 million strong mayor campaign um, by our mayor, Daryl Steinberg. Um, and so we're really trying to build momentum and power. Um, but we think in this case, if this is real and if it happens as quickly as we worry it'll happen, um, um, we're going to get caught a little flat-footed and could really use our state comrade support um, to the degree that you're able to, even if it's just elevating the issue so we can keep doing the good work here in Sacramento. So thank you, Omar, for the time. I won't take any more tonight, but appreciate being with you all. No, thank you so much for stopping by. And I can't see the chat, but hopefully there's a link in there to contribute to your campaign. Um, I did that uh, today after I heard about that. And to give you an idea of the fuckery going on in Sacramento, you know, every council member gets to pick their own staff, and that's wait, 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 wait. hold up! I thought we, I thought you're supposed to be telling us why you're making the changes to the bylaws. Communication staff, and then the city. This is more distraction, you guys. Had to get a restraining order to prevent her communications officer from coming to city hall. <laughs> Garbage fuckery is that? This is what? literally just another <laughs> anecdotal story to distract us from the fact that they are not addressing why they're making changes to their bylaws. And, um, you know, thankfully, um, Katie organized. Oh my God, even you guys. And then they defeated that, and the city and the city's attorney was horribly embarrassed. But um, it's that kind of uh, action and venom which informs what's about to happen potentially in her district. If you so, ever want to know um, where Jimmy Dore gets his ideas here, for how to do um, distraction and, and uh, smear campaigns, um, so now I think comes now right out of this network, y'all. About I think we're doing okay on time. So I can take a little bit of time now just before we adjourn, and then there'll be an opportunity for announcements. But anybody wants to take a minute for announcements? You're going to talk but, about um, it? What happened at the last e-board? Here we so, go. There was, what folks saw if you attended the e-board, was a long diatribe by uh -huh. the rules chair against the progressive conscience. And uh, here's what... You agreed to you. it. You guys literally <laughs> agreed to this bullshit. It's my opinion we never violated the bylaws. Um, but, you know, we don't get to decide what the bylaw, violation, what the bylaw violations are. That's what the rules committee does. And they're filled they with... They agree to it, everybody. Progressive caucus. So as soon as the... As soon as the first complaint came forward that, hey, what you're doing with the PAC is not allowed, we said, sure, no problem. We'll shut it down. We'll fix it. Uh, we the website is still up. We're in the rules committee. So just tell us what you want us to do, and we will do that. And we reached an agreement. And during those hearings in the rules committee, we were universally lauded by the rules committee uh, leadership. A, the Progressive Caucus is doing a great thing. Um, they're cooperating. We're going to make sure this gets done. The caucus is not at risk so long as it does these things and they've agreed to do these things, no problem. And then we set about doing those things that we promised to do. We shut down the pack. We stopped taking any money. Uh, we uh, started preparing the letters that are supposed to go out to contributors, and those will go out uh, Monday or Tuesday. They're all approved now after review. What about the all the candidates, Amr? Um, and we did you know, everything else that we said mm -hmm. uh, we would do. Um, but in that agreement, there was a provision there that said, 
30 days after the executive board meeting, which is you know, a couple of weeks ago, 30 days after that, we had to report all this stuff into the rules committee. Um, and we were prepared to do that. But along the way, we told people sort of informally, hey, we're, we're taking care of all the things. Here's an email. Please look at these uh, documents and these letters that we're going to agree upon. Uh -huh. So now the same time that that completely uncontroversial process is happening, what is also happening is that we are making it very clear to the party that we are not okay with fossil fuel money. We're not okay with law enforcement money. We are not okay with being silenced at the executive board. We are not okay with essentially being shut out of the party on these issues. And made it, and made it clear that there's going to be direct action coming up and that is going to get be uh, very uncomfortable for all of you party leaders that are engaging in this kind of nonsense. So the coming together of those two things at the executive board was mm -hmm. completely uncontroversial. And then what has a, you know significant potential will be very controversial in the park. Look at how nervous he is. In, um, the Rusty Hicks is a representative, the, the appointee, the chair on the rules committee, taking time to say things that were just plain false about what was going on in the rules committee process regarding the claim against the Progressive Caucus. So what he said, essentially, is that the Progressive Caucus is behaving inappropriately and what they've done is serious violations. And we need to make clear that no caucus should do those things. And if anybody does, um, you know, we will uh, bring the hammer down. All that, I think, is completely appropriate discourse. And it, it's his, uh, you know, his role to bring policy for the party, that's fine. But what's completely inappropriate, what's uh, objectively and verifiably false, is what he continued on with, is to say that the Progressive Caucus was not doing what it said it would do, that there was no evidence that we had performed and were engaging in those things. And what I can tell you is that we had email exchanges, just not with him, because that wasn't his job. There's a subcommittee to do that. We shut down the pack but we didn't forward him the documents because that's not his job. It's a subcommittee that we are working on. So yes, it's entirely true that if he looked through his email and on his phone, he didn't have any emails from the Progressive Caucus because that's not his job. That's what the subcommittee was meant to do. And we engaged fully. So I just want everybody to know that um, that is just politics trying to undermine the position of the Progressive Caucus because they know what's coming next is where we have more of a phone, right? Ha. We are right on the issue <laughs> oh of God. protecting our oh God, black even. and brown siblings, ensuring that they're not incarcerated for no good reason. We are right on the issue of protecting the future habitability of the planet. We are right on the issue of, of getting corporate money out of the party. But what they decided is that they, since they cannot talk about that in any kind of sensible way, and retain moral authority of their own, what they do is just make stuff up about this rules complaint and hope that the progressive uh, caucus will wow. get in that way. So look, I'm not worried about it. I think most folks saw through it. I'm, I was very pleased that uh, the caucus officers who were in on that meeting raised their hand and responded. Because what I will tell you all is that the rules chair uh, who is engaged in that diatribe he knew that morning, because so I texted him and we and we spoke about it, that I wasn't going to be able to attend, that I was actually in the hospital that morning. I had uh, kidney stones and, you know, dealt with it. It took four or five hours. The next day I was fine. But he knew I was laid up. And he never told me that, hey, I'm going to say this, or hey, there's no evidence that you've given me, or hey, Amr, you're not complying. You know, please give that information. No discussion of it at all, just this diatribe. And I, yeah, I was uh, thankful that, so many of you spoke up, and Manuel Zapata came on and said, "Hey, what do we do to get more to uh, regain our position in the party? Should we start taking fossil fuel money? Is that what makes you happy?" And it was epic, and you know others chimed in, and then you know a lot of folks started posting about it. And by the end of the meeting, they were forced to uh, recognize me, and I spoke to my uh, debilitated condition and made clear that what he said was false, and that really. What I think is more important for people in the party, look, politics 
uh, gets folks worked up. We're worked up here today. And the rules chair got worked up. And he said some stuff out of line. And he said some stuff was false. And during that meeting, we asked him and gave him the opportunity to just correct the record. He said something that was wrong. Just say, hey, you know what? I said something that was wrong. I'm a man of character. I, I just uh, shouldn't have said that. But the rest of what I said was true. Um, but he didn't do that. And that's just, it's just disheartening, you know, to be in a party where people in positions of leadership um, won't admit when they say something that's incorrect. Um, about the people that they purport to work with and respect. So um, I'm happy to hear from any of the other officers if they want to talk about that issue or if there's anything else that's come up. But um, a few moments from now, we will uh, adjourn and then we'll uh, have announcement time. I just <clears throat> just want to pin off that. Thank you, Amr. I think it was important for everyone to see that we're we're super transparent. <clears throat> We've been as transparent as we possibly can. This is live streamed on our Facebook, right? We want to be honest with you all, but they, folks know that the left can eat itself alive and they're going to try to sow division because that's the only way they can beat us right now is because we have, they know that we have all the history, all the documentation, all that stuff. So when, if you hear stuff again, if other accusations are made, reach out to us before, you know, <laughs> echoing those accusations and, and we'll be transparent. I'll, I'll respond to you on Facebook in full transparent that you can screenshot and share with people. Yeah, he came after care, me on just, Twitter, y'all. Just, you know, we're not doing this stuff for any self-gain. Because if we were in politics for self-gain, I, I would have voted for Nancy Pelosi the last three elections, right? Like, like if we were in self, like, politics for self-gain, we would be acting like our opponents. And I just want to remind you literally that, selling like, Bernie's name. And we got to stick together and we can't eat each other alive right now. We need to stick together because, uh, like, the fate of our planet is literally at stake right now. Okay, then shut down your pack and stop doing an endorsement Thanks, racket. Brandon, you nailed it. Um, any of the other caucus officers want to be heard on that or something else? I know that... Um, gonna, run your right. meetings according yeah, to Robert's know. rules. That would be nice, too. Here, but um, one of the things that I just want to say is, you know, that's kind of the drama and the tea around here. But let's also not forget that even though the Progressive Caucus is taking some heat on this, that we would not have the confidence to do this kind of stuff if it wasn't for all of the great support we've had from our members, as well as other allies, such as those that coming from the Environmental Caucus. I just want to give a really big special thanks to Igor, Chair of the Environmental Caucus, and all the work that their executive board and their membership did to put on a meeting, uh, probably one of the most epic meetings I've been in, in terms of length, we had to cover a lot of things, but in terms of solidarity as well, and, and just so you guys know, if you were on that meeting when it was over, officers spent more of their own time for another two hours after that, which they didn't need to, to go and talk and hash these kinds of things out. I think that's where a lot of our camaraderie gets built upon Zoom now, nowadays. So just thank you to everybody who's involved in those types of things. You know, this is a progressive caucus executive board meeting, but it's still, you know, just part, just one part of the progressive movement as a whole, especially within the party, trying to make change. So again, thank you to Igor, the Environmental Caucus, and all the rest of our allies as well, too. I see, it looks like Emma had her hand first, so I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight Emma. You're not to spotlight me. <laughs> um, okay. I just wanted to, <laughs> I just wanted to say, and I, you know, this is like in conversations that I've had, All right, forget you know, this. With, she she with has a terrible connection. The Let, they're gonna wrap up right now anyway. So let's um let's wrap up here. We don't, we don't need their bullshit at this point. We do not need their bullshit at this point. So um so they gave us a bunch of excuses. Uh, they did not take accountability for what happened. They barely did. They're like, yeah, you know, we were kind of not in compliance, and uh, you know, we're trying to make it right, but the party's so horrible. That's not how I, I literally was at that meeting. I was at that meeting. I got invited to it at the last minute. I gave public testimony at that meeting. And um, the, the fella, the chair that was in charge of the rules committee said uh, he was conducting the meeting. He was taking all sorts of public comments. 
and um, listening to both sides of the argument, he, he invited it for open discussion for everybody, unlike Amr, who only was like, we'll take two people. The, rule, the chair of the rules committee took tons and tons of comments. I mean, I was on that call for like over an hour, and it was all com it was all public commentary, and um, it was people discussing their uh, opinions on whether or not the caucus should be penalized. And I was one of those people, and I'm like, look, I don't think that they're handling their business fairly. I don't even think they're condu they conduct their meetings by Robert's rules. Um, the chair of the rules committee said it seems that we have a consensus that the progressive caucus uh, had a quorum when they decided to form this this pack therefore they will be penalized as a quorum if it was only a couple of people who decided to put that pack together then it would have just been those specific people penalized but because they universally decided as a I'm so sick of getting bullshitted. I don't know about you guys, but I'm really getting sick of bullshitted, and that's exactly what we get out of these people every fucking time. Uh, by the way, okay, so those comments that were happening in the chat about the, the uh, sequoias, I'll have to take a look at the article, but I'll tell you straight up, I've been camping up in the Sierras since I was three years old, and uh, uh, I know for a fact that I had, like, I had a ranger tell me, like, point out a mountainside to me in Sequoia Kings Canyon and say, look at all that, look at, look at everything that's up on that hillside. We had a severe fire that year. We had a severe fire uh, uh, about two decades ago, and now that entire mountainside is covered with sequoia trees because the only way sequoia pine cones open up is through fire. Whether it's extreme or not, the only way the sequoia pine cones will open up is with fire. That's why they do a lot of controlled burns. So fire in a sequoia forest isn't terrible because it actually means that the trees will reproduce and they are an endangered tree species. So that is like the, the worst fucking example you can provide when you're talking about the danger of forest fires. Fire is incredibly good for sequoias. And that's why when I look at a lot of these people who are like performative pieces of crap I, I'm just like really like you couldn't even done a little deeper digging on this there are a lot of reasons why forest fire is bad but that is like the last reason you want to cite because fire is imperative to the reproduction process of sequoia trees I'm so sick of these people who really don't know what they're talking about. I know, I'm like, <laughs> this fires me up a lot. Okay, so this will conclude my coverage for the night because they have currently run 20 minutes over and now they're doing announcements. So they'll probably go past nine. I'm done though. I'm done for the evening. It's clear to me that they are not taking responsibility for their actions. They're trying to blame the party. They're trying to become martyrs. And on top of it, uh, they staged, uh, I have never seen the caucus so active before with their counter protests. With their count, oh, I know I just froze up, right? With their counter protests. And so all of these counter actions right now are performative, distractionary bullshit. It's bullshit. They literally just said that they were offered, the party was, uh, Rusty was offered money from um, the, the uh, cop. Uh, labor, labor police. <laughs> Getting that wrong. The police labor unions. <laughs> the labor police. The police labor unions. He was offered money and he turned it down. So their biggest deal is some sixty thousand dollars surrounding some sort of fossil fuel money, but they're very vague about what that is. Can you guys provide some level of receipts? I've been asking for weeks. What are your receipts on that? What did he take exactly? What was it? What did he take? And in what capacity did he take it? Because from the last I heard is that it was like a, it was supposed to be like clean and it was like um, natural gas for um, 
the San Francisco convention and he wasn't even chair yet. That was like the weekend he got elected. He wasn't even the chair yet. So what do you, what do you, are you accusing him of taking? Because that was the last accusation I heard was that it was natural energy gas, which is like fracking. Yeah, that's fracking. But it was for the convention in which he was elected. He wasn't chair yet. So what did he take? What did he take?